So a big thing that we want to, I think that we want to do as improvisers is, you know, hopefully we're expressing ourselves, of course, on our instruments, but we're singing melodies that we hear in our head. And a lot of times we can get caught up in learning, you know, licks and, you know, phrases and it all, that's fine. It has a place in the sense of, you know, how do we take licks and phrases, just like taking words and you know, the, in, the, in, in our English language and putting them together co to combine sentences. We're doing the same thing musically when we're playing licks and phrases. But how do we keep ourselves from sounding like a bunch of licks and phrases, just one lick after the next, lick after the next, after the next, after the next? We have to find some way to make music over the changes. And the first most important thing in my mind is learning how to play over one chord change, which is what we're doing here with this concert F down in seventh chord. So if we talk about notes, we only got 12 notes in music. It's only 12 sounds in Western music as we know. And those notes are all comprised in a chromatic scale, right? So when we're talking about playing over a chord or one chord change, generally speaking, diatonically, we have seven different notes in any given scale, right? And this is a dominant seventh scale. So of course we know a dominant seventh scale is different from a major scale in the sense that we lower the seventh note. So in this case, instead of playing E natural concert, we're playing E flat. F, G, A, B flat, C, D, E flat, F. So, there's only seven notes in that scale, but we got 12 different sounds in music, right? So, the most important notes in that scale are what we call, or what I like to call, the CTs, short for the chord tones. Numerically speaking, that's one, three, five, and seven. So, that would be F, A, C, E flat. Those are the money notes. No matter what order we play those in, how we play them, what rhythm we play, they sound great. For example. am I going to go? Always sounds great because those are, like I said, the money notes, the CTs, the chord tones. So that's four notes, right? One, three, five, and seven. Flat seven in this case. And we say, oh, well, we got seven different notes in the scale. So that means we've got three more notes. Numerically speaking, those are two, four, and six. How do they sound? <laughs> I just played but somehow harmonically they don't make quite as much sense why because our ear almost hears like we're playing in a totally different key even though those three notes are in the F dominant scale so now we want to turn our attention to well how do we 
utilize these sounds, these 12 notes. So we say the chord tones sound great. We can play them in any fashion we want. Two, four, and six, diatonically, are notes that are in between the chord tones, one, three, five, and seven. And they tend to want to resolve to those chord tones. So if we think about two, four, and six, if they're surrounded by chord tones, then that means that they want to resolve up or down. So for example, two wants to resolve either down to one, the root, or up to three. Four wants to resolve down to three or up to five. Six wants to resolve down to five or up to our flat seven. Let's hear what it sounds like utilizing these resolutional up or down tendencies. Forgive Jamie Avery Saul's count off. Two, this is two, one, going to one and three. three, three four. <laughs> two is a passing tone, right? So we can say that two either will approach one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, or it will approach three. Two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three, or it could pass between the both of them. One, two, three, two, one. And so how is two functioning? It's not functioning on, when we hear music, most of the time, we tend to hear the strongest part of the harmony on downbeats. So that's why I said, oh, we could literally play chord tones all day long. They'll be on upbeats and downbeats. So therefore, we hear those notes, and it's like, oh, money. They're right in harmonic place. But two, four, and six have these tendencies to want to resolve up and down. So how will we do it? Again, we use them as approach notes to the surrounding chord tones. Two, down to one, up to three. Four, down to three, up to six. Six, or up to five, six, down to five, up to flat seven. And we can also use those notes in passing. So two can pass between one and three, four can pass between three and five, six can pass between five and flat seven. What does that sound like if you put them all together like that? six also in time. Yes, I can play two, four, and six on downbeats, which is where we really want to hear the strongest part of harmony, chord tones. But if I do play them on downbeats, I make sure that they always resolve. So two is always resolving up or down. Four is always resolving up or down. Six is always resolving up or down. So therefore, we get this sense of tension, which is what music is really all about, tension and release. How do we build tension and release? And the two things we're talking about is right now are harmonic tension using two, four, and six tension that releases to those money notes, chord tones, one, three, five, or seven, and rhythmic tension. Oh, if we know downbeats are where we really want to hear that solid foundation of chord tones, we can create tension by playing those nine chord tones, two, four, or six on downbeats creates tension and then it resolves like this. One, Jamie's count off. Two, one, two, three, four. <laughs> creating this kind of harmonic tension of where we hear those notes even without knowing theoretically what they are. I believe most people can hear that, oh, two, four, and six want to resolve up or down to those chord tones. So, simply speaking, this is how we've used seven diatonic notes of the scale. One, two, three, four, five, six, flat seven, one, one, three, five, seven. Money notes, chord tones, the CTs. Two, four, and six 
NCTs, as in non-chord tones. So two, four, and six have two tendencies. They either want to resolve up or they want to resolve down to the surrounding chord tones. So if we say we, oh, diatonically speaking, we've only got seven notes in our given scale. But we got 12 notes in music, so that means we got five other notes, right? And these other five notes are not in the scale at all. They're notes that exist chromatically in the chromatic scale. So, for example, we have a flat two or a flat nine. So if we're in the key of F, flat nine will be a half step above the tonic, which would be G flat. Now, with chromatic nine chord tones, let's call that chromatic nine chord tones, C in CTs. So we got CTs, chord tones, NCTs, non-chord tones. Ah, we should probably come up with a better way to say that. But let's stick with NCTs. And chromatic non-chord non -chord tones, CNTCs. CNCTs. So what are the chromatic non-chord tones going to do? Well, they're not as flexible as the diatonic non-chord tones or the uh, NCTs because they tend to want to resolve one way. So that flat nine, or the half step above the root, wants to go to the closest chord tone. And that closest chord tone is the root. So again, I'll play it so you can hear it with the play along.
all 12 notes, everything I just talked about together. CTs, chord tones. Where do we really want to hear chord tones? Nice and plushy sounding on the strong beats, on down beats. So that's not to say that it has to always be on down beats, right? Because, you know, we want to be creative and music again is about tension and release and we're talking about rhythmic tension and harmonic tension. So harmonic tension says, oh, let's introduce the other two groups of notes. Diatonic nine chord tones. Two, four, and six. What do the diatonic non-chord tones want to do? They want to resolve up or down because they're surrounded by chord tones, one, three, five, and seven. And the last group, again, chromatic non-chord tones. So we said a flat nine, a flat third, a sharp 11 or a sharp four, a flat 13 or a flat six, or a major seventh in this particular case. There is major seven, remember, is the one that goes both directions, down to the flat seven or up to the tonic. So what you just heard me do was improvise using those 12 notes in the ways we talked about. Two, four, and six happen as approaches. One direction, start on a nine chord tone, two, four, six, and resolve to the next closest chord tone. Or we could do those in passing, remember, because they're surrounded. One, two, three, four, five. Singing the first five notes of the scale utilizes diatonic nine chord tones in passing between chord tones. The first thing you hear, one, two, three, four, Five. And on the strong beats, what do we hear? Chord tones. Ba, bu, da, du, da. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But everything doesn't have to be moving in eighth notes either. And we said harmonically, how can we create tension or rhythmically? Oh, by really sounding like we're emphasizing those nine chord tones, be they chromatic or diatonic nine chord tones, but eventually always creating tension that wants to ah, resolve down to one, three, five, or seven. What's some more ways we can ornament these chord tones? So we can do what's called an enclosure. An enclosure is to approach your money note or your chord tone from two nine chord tones. In this particular case, we're gonna approach it starting first from a half step above, then we go to a half step below, then you reach that chord tone. So this is an enclosure of concert F. So what that means is we're going to start on G flat. Then we're going to go to what note? If we're doing the closure, we say it's a half step above to a half step below. A half step below F is E. And then we're going to resolve to F. This is what it's going to sound like. One, two, one, two, three. <laughs> creating a lot of rhythmic tension there, right? Because I started on the downbeat with a nine chord tone and went immediately to another nine chord tone. But the thing is, it doesn't really matter because that's all that tension we talked about, harmonic and rhythmic, where we get the release at the end. The last thing your ear hears is that one, three, five, or seven. So we can enclose roots, we can enclose a third, we can enclose five, and we can enclose, in this case, again, a flat seven because we're playing a down in seven chord. So this is what it's gonna sound like. I'll enclose each one in order. A root, a third, a fifth, then a flat seven. One, two, one, two, three, four. <laughs> Thank you. 
chord tone again by starting a half step above, then going a half step below, resolving to the chord tone. We can approach a chord tone by using two diatonic non chord tones. So, for example, if we want to go to, well, let's say we're going to, we're really trying to get to three. We can play two, four, creates harmonic and rhythmic tension again because we hear two non chord tones back to back, but eventually they all resolve, right? So, here's Two, four to three. One, two, one, two, three, four. <laughs> and then change directions. Playing off of the root doesn't work, right? Because you get one, three, five, seven. And if I change directions and move down a half step, or down to the next note of the scale, it takes me to six. So, in my mind, I wouldn't necessarily do that. But if I start on two, two, four, six, seven, two, four, two, four, six, root, down to the flat seven. What if I started on three? Three, five, seven, nine. Oh, I could go from nine up to three or down to one, right? Because we said, oh, two or nine is that diatonic nine chord tone that can pass. What if I started on the four? That drops us off if I'm only playing four notes on a major third. So, wouldn't necessarily use that one because if I moved, Oh, it dropped me off at a uh, diatonic non chord tone in either direction. So, these are all things to experiment with. And real practicing, when practicing is fun sometimes, it's like, oh, just coming up with different permutations of how can I, how many different ways can you do something? Or what happens if I play an arpeggio that's four notes and then I change directions? Or what if it's only three notes? Or what if it's just two notes? So, there's all kinds of things you can come up with. Or ways to hear. The nice thing about practicing in this way and, you know, limiting your reading from books sometimes is that you're just kind of relying on your ear to hear. And it's some, in some ways a little more intuitive because when we're playing at the end of the day, we're not really seeing our great favorite souls reading souls out of books and whatnot. They're improvising. They're doing it based off of what they have heard. And so, Back to my initial statement about we don't want everything to be just a bunch of licks that we've learned in a sense that it could sound very formulaic versus uh, hearing more naturally in the sense of just hearing melodies. And it becomes this whole thing of singing melodies and that's what we're really doing when we're improvising. So just using, again, those 12 notes, playing very simple ideas, I can make all kinds of melodies. So this isn't going to sound like your favorite you know, necessarily Charlie Parker or Dexter Gordon or Chris Potter solos or Coltrane so much, but it, it's just a simpler version of that because they're doing the exact 
same things, just on a higher level. So this is just simple singing. And as everything that I play, I promise you, I can hear in my head before I play it. And this is just using, again, 12 notes over one chord. One. It's gonna sound simple. Two. One, two, three, four. get away from just using the blue scale to generalize particular sounds. And so by generalizing, we have this thing called harmonic generalization, where we can take a scale and play it over chord changes. And that one scale will cover the sound of the different changes, even though it doesn't necessarily make the exact notes. And by exact notes, we're talking about, oh, harmonically speaking, those money notes, one, three, five, and seven. Oh, some of the notes are chord tones, some of them aren't chord tones and some of the notes won't exist in any of the scales of chord changes at all depending on what tune you play so but the generalization of chord changes can happen by using the blue scale and that's a great place to start but we want to expand our harmonic vocabulary our rhythmic or our melodic sense so that it isn't all just blue scale all the time so that we can actually make choices about what to play based off of hopefully what we're hearing in our heads so we've just played over one chord change. So now let's talk about playing over a set of chord changes, which means, oh, now based off of whatever we're playing, we can't use the same notes all the time. So let's take a second here and talk about playing over a simple 12 bar blues based off of the one, four, and five chord. And this is gonna be a blues in the key of concert B flat. All right, so we said we we're gonna deal with a 12 bar blues. So easy way to think of a 12 bar blues in the simplest format consists of one chord or three chords. The tonic chord, one, the four chord, and the five chord. So if we think of it, three, uh, three symmetrical four bar phrases, the first four measures is all gonna be based off of the one chord, which in our case here is a B flat dominant seventh chord. B flat, D, F, A flat, if we wanna use chord tones. The second four bar phrase utilizes two bars of the four chord, E flat dominant, E flat G, B flat, D flat, back to two bars of the tonic, the concert B flat dominant. So again, the first four bars is all the tonic dominant, B flat dominant. The second four bar phrase, two bars of four, followed by two bars of one. The last four bar phrase is what we call the turnaround, where this section is different in the sense that chords change every bar, where up until then, it's been two bars or more for each chord change. So the last four bar phrase gives us one bar of five, concert F, one bar of four, E flat dominant, one bar of one, concert B flat, and then the last bar is F, which is like saying, amen, five going back to one at the top. So again, first four bars, all tonic dominant, second four bar phrase, two bars of four, followed by two bars of tonic. Last four bar phrase is one bar of four, five, one bar of four, one bar of one, and the last bar, five. So right now I'm gonna play just utilizing chord tones. So again, same thing can apply here where we talk about, oh, how do our notes work? Three groupings, chord tones, diatonic non-chord tones, chromatic non-chord tones. So we're just using chord tones to outline the sound of the changes. 
changes like that, oh, I'd immediately be able to say, oh, it sounds like you're playing a blues, because we're hearing the outlining of the harmony by just using the money notes, one, three, five, and seven. So we can say the same thing with diatonic notes applies to that also. So now here's the tune utilizing diatonic non-chord tones, two, four, and six. Remember we said those can approach chord tones or they can pass between. One. This is what it sounds like improvising using all three. So I'll use chord tones, I'll use diatonic non chord tones as passing or as approaches, and chromatic non chord tones we said tend to primarily approach in one direction. Example flat nine only goes to the root, sharp four tends to really want to go to the five, etc. Et one, two, one, two, three. <laughs> There he's just using diatonic as passing notes, or he's using it as approach notes. Remember we said the other kind of ornamentations were also saying, oh, diatonic non-chord tone to another diatonic non-chord tone resolving to a chord tone, which I'm making up stuff as we go here. Let's call that a almost like a diatonic enclosure, because an enclosure, as I explained it the first time, when we think about bebop harmony, says, oh, we're going to approach from a half step above then go a half step below, and then get to that chord tone. Uh, so that's, uh, we can call it a chromatic enclosure. A diatonic enclosure involves not using chromatic neighboring tones, but diatonic neighboring tones, and saying, oh, two, four, two, four, three, four, six, five, six, seven, or six, one, seven, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Again, notice things that I do is, I, I can hear it. I know exactly what it sounds like. And that comes from lots of practicing of it. But you want to be able to do the same thing because at the end of the day, playing is we want to play what we already hear in our heads. We're hearing melodies or we're hearing harmonic passages and then we're just speaking them through the instrument that we, our instrument of choice. All right, so here's a chorus using chromaticism, uh, using enclosures and uh, what did I call them? Diatonic enclosures, all right? One, two, one, two, three. <laughs> So, 
versus diatonicism. Where if we think about eras of jazz, when we listen to earlier jazz recordings, I'm talking about the music of Louis Armstrong or music of the almost like the pre-swing era, one of the things we heard was lots more of kind of this diatonicism in our improvisations. And one of the things that the bebop era brought about was a greater use of chromaticism. And you want to be familiar with what those kind of things sound like to hear chromaticism versus diatonicism too. But again, this all comes from practicing. And so I put this chorus together where I can improv improvise using all the things we talked about, chord tones, diatonic non-chord tones, chromatic non-chord tones. Putting them all together makes us play over one change at a time. So now the thing becomes, oh, how do we play over chord changes so it doesn't sound like we play an idea stop when the chord changes, then we start again and play a new idea over that chord change and stop and wait for the next chord change to happen. This becomes playing over chord changes. And when we hear talk about people, when we hear people talk about playing over chord changes, it sounds daunting sometimes. Where in essence, the only time we're really playing over the chord changes is at the very end of one bar of one chord change and where it changes. So we're talking about one note an eighth note, or a quarter note, or whatever the note may be, or sustaining a sound, creating you know harmonic or rhythmic tension and resolving still. But where the chord change happens and what you play at that particular time determines whether we're really playing over changes or not. So this is an example of not playing over the changes. This is what I call playing the change. So playing the change means I play the chord change at the time. And so from a practical standpoint, this is like something I would practice. Let's just say I'm going to arpeggiate the chord changes to the 12 bar blues. One, four, and five chords. One. Ascending. Two. Arpeggios. One, money two, notes. Seven, one, three, five, seven. Yeah, I changed up the rhythm a little bit. But in essence, what you heard was I never played over the changes. I'm always playing within a bar. One and two and one and three. Bop, ba ba do bop. One and three, one, one and three, four, etc. Whatever. So, but you never heard me play anything that connected one bar to the next particularly where the chord change. And the chord changes from the fourth bar to the fifth bar, where we go from one chord to the four chord. And then the sixth bar to the seventh bar, where we go from the four chord back to the one. Or from the eighth to the ninth, where we go from one to five. And then remember in the last four bars, the chord changes every bar. So you never heard me playing over those changes because I'm always just playing an idea that makes the sound of the change at the time. And that's what we're hearing a lot of times when we hear folks play, where we can say, oh, they may be playing a particular pattern or idea that works over that, but sometimes it's just playing harmonic information that's relative to the chord at the time. Now, playing over the changes says, how do we connect? And so, one thing we want to start doing is connecting things in a linear fashion. Because when we think about how we tend to hear music in Western culture, we tend to hear things very linearly. Like, it would, if I just played arpeggios, one, three, five, and seven all day long, I mean, why would you want to hear me play a five minute solo just using chord tones? It gets to sound rather monotonous. Even though there's a number of ways we could, you know, do it using what order do we play the notes in? What kind of rhythmic tension do we create? There isn't any harmonic tension because why? It's all the money notes if we were just using chord tones, all the chord tones. So, how do we play over changes linearly? And this means we need to be able to connect one chord to the next chord in a stepwise fashion so that it doesn't sound like every time a chord changes, we're jumping or arpeggiating or skipping around. And so what that involves is we need to be able to say what connects one note to the next. And so what I'm going to do on this next chorus is I'm going to start off on the seventh of the tonic chord. And I'm going to try to play a descending line. 
that goes downwards through the entire 12 bars. Let's see what happens. So notice that I'm not gonna change notes unless the chord changes. So when the chord changes, I'm gonna, you'll hear me move. But my goal is to move no more than a whole step because what we're trying to avoid, jumping, arpeggiating. So I'm gonna start on concert A flat, which is the flat seven of our tonic chord. So remember, when we get to the end of bar four, you're gonna hear me move because we're going from the one chord to the four chord. At the end of bar six, you're gonna hear me move because we're going from the four back to the one. And so every time the chord changes, again, remember one, 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 four, four, one, one, five, four, one, five. That's our set of changes. So every time that number or that chord changes, you're gonna hear me move. One, two, one, I'm trying to do a descending. <laughs> And so, things that you should have noticed is that, oh, I played a descending line for the most part. One time, I had to change directions and ascend in order to change directions again and keep descending. So, what happens there, though, is that every time the chord changed, I moved, right? And I never moved by more than a whole step. Why is that important? Because remember back to what we talked about our... What do we want to hear when we're playing over changes? Oh, chord tones. We talked about diatonic non-chord tones, chromatic chord tones. How do two and four work? How do the chromatic ones work? How do the ornamentations of chord tones work as far as enclosures, diatonic enclosures, etc., etc., are non-chord, non-chord to a chord tone? All those things tended to happen within a step, a whole step or a half step. So therefore, I can play, and I'm going to play the exact same line using the same numbers. I'm going to start on seven. And now I'm going to change up the rhythms a little bit. I'll still change the note every time the chord changes, but I'll use some of the things we talked about earlier. One, two. So, to make it one, interesting, two, rhythm. Three. Descending with one, all descending except for one time. But I changed up the rhythms of what I was doing, what I was doing over the repeated chord tones, right? The repeated measures of one chord. But every time you heard the motion, oh, it was either using chromaticism. So if the note that we're going to is a whole step away, which is within our rules, because we said we don't want to move more than a whole step. If we have a whole step, if our goal note is a whole step away, that means there's what in between? A passing tone. So for example, if we're going from the flat seven of the tonic. And we're going to the four chord. The easiest resolution is to resolve down by a half step. Right? So our distance is a half step to our target note. So if it's only a half step, what could we do using one of our ornamentations? Oh, we could make it the beginning of an enclosure, which we said is going to a target note but approaching it from a half step above, then going a half step below, and then hitting the target note. So therefore, this flat seven that we're on of the tonic is a half step above the third of the four chord, the new chord, so we can make it an enclosure. Right, nice. And so as we're playing, now I'm on the third of the four chord, which is a concert G. And the next note I'm going to, if I'm trying to move descending, is going to go to a concert F, which is the what? Fifth of the tonic chord. And F 
our G to F is a whole step. So that means we have a passing tone. So I use the passing tone in between and it becomes a chromatic approach tone to the fifth. Or I could say three, three of the four chord, in close, five of the one chord. And so now what we get is a sense of every time the chord changes, oh, it's a linear kind of motion. Now to take it to the next level, it just becomes, oh, instead of moving at the beginning of every chord change, maybe we should try moving every bar. So we're gonna change a note every bar. So what this is gonna start doing is creating more tension, why? Because let's say if we just play a whole note every bar. If we're moving in steps, oh, we're gonna have one bar that'll be a chord tone, in particular with the first four bars. The next bar will be a non-chord tone because chord tones are surrounded by non-chord tones. But what we'll get is a elongated sense of consonants, tension, resolving to consonants, maybe tension again in the fourth bar, resolving to consonants. Let's see what happens if I just play a different note at the beginning of every bar, but still trying to create a line that moves no more than a whole step at a time. One, two, starting on the seventh one, again. Two, three, This note doesn't necessarily work or the note that I'm trying to get to which is a chord tone of the new chord I'm already at that note you know a bar before it so instead of repeating it again what can I do oh I create some kind of way to get away from the note I'm on even though that's the same note I want to be at so what do I do I go away from that note and come back to it again so therefore it doesn't sound like I repeat right so again the goal is to create linear motion or a line and when we think about linear motion there are lines that we hear in the great soloists you know they don't tend to repeat notes so much even though at the end of the day there's only 12 of them so of course they're getting repeated but not back to back which in my mind just sounds like if you were musically stuttering right so how do we eliminate the stuttering is to every time if we find that we're getting to a note that we want to go to but we're already there we got to go away from the note that we're on and that we want to go to and then come back to it. So therefore, we get this continuous sense of motion. So these are just some ideas to get started. And you'll find that you can find all kinds of ways to practice. And one of the best kind of ways is to start by doing things like this. One, by practicing guide tones, by saying, OK, look at a sheet of chord changes and say, I want to start on a chord tone. And every time the chord changes, I want to change notes. So trying to make a moving line to get you to a chord tone of the next chord within a step. Sometimes you might have to move slower or you might have to move faster, but hopefully you start figuring out ways to do it. And what you're doing is just you wind up not learning vocabulary from just reading vocabulary on a book, in a book, but you wind up doing it from logical ways of making lines. And so, Important thing I want you to remember from today is just talking about, it may sound simple to you, but you'll be surprised at how this will open up your level of thought of what you're playing, hearing what you're playing, and thinking about getting from one place in a chord change or a tune to the next. And so, if we think about, again, our one chord topics, improvising over one chord, money notes, chord tones, one, three, five, and seven, diatonic nine chord tones, two, four, and six, they wanna resolve up or down. Chromatic nine chord tones, flat two, flat three, sharp four, flat five, major seventh. Those tend to go one direction, except for the major seventh. 
which wants to go down to a flat seven or up to a tonic. Remember, we're talking about improvising over dominant seven kind of sounds. You can apply these rules to all kinds of chords. It doesn't matter if it's major, dominant, or minor. It just becomes how do notes function, knowing that we have those money notes, chord tones, diatonic non-chord tones, and chromatic non-chord tones. And improvising or trying to hear those notes in a way that makes sense, remembering that our music tends to move very linearly. So I'm glad I got to spend a little time talking to you all about this today. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me reach out to me via email. You can reach out to me at my email at Purdue. It's H-A-R-R-I-888 at Purdue, E-D-U. Or you can reach out to me through my website, Gerard at GerardHarris.com. J-A-R-R-A-R-D. That's how you spell my name. So again, it's been a pleasure talking to you guys. Uh, some helpful tools. Uh, what you heard me playing along with were two Jamie Abersall volumes. One was volume... 84, I believe, which is called Dominant Sevens, where they have entire tracks. It's like five minutes of just playing over one chord. Uh, another helpful, uh, the other one I used was volume 54, which is a uh, maiden voice, and I just use what's called the B-flat shuffle blues. But you can make up your own tracks if you have an app called iReal Pro. On iReal Pro, it has some tracks you can download that people have uploaded to the virtual, you know, chat room, whatever you want to call it, or it has the ability where you can learn how to make your own practice track. So if you said, oh, well, I want to make a, a, a song where the chord changes, it's the same chord, but it changes every two bars, you can make your own kind of play along tracks. Doesn't sound as good as Abersol because you're playing with a computer generated thing versus playing with people that actually recorded something. But again, it's invaluable in the sense that you could have that in your pocket. I mean, you know, who gets to take around CD players or, you know, whatever all the time. You know, but to have that app, you know, and learn how to work that iReal Pro, you can have a band in your pocket all the time. So, hopefully you all got something good out of the day. I appreciate you all listening. I appreciate you all checking out the CMO Jazz Festival. And I hope to hear from you or see you again. Take it easy. Keep practicing.